Then there's a one hour interaction, the particle self gravitate and so on and so forth. So it depends on what problem you're talking about. But there's a sequence of quantum phase transitions, and then you get into a classical domain where you have interstellar dust, which clusters, and that's like a phase separation process, except with a one over R, uh, um, a, a Coulombic, uh, not, not Coulombic, well, also Coulombic, gravitational interaction, basically. And of course, these uh, astrophysics guys do lots of uh, simulations of this problem, and you know that if you take a one over R interaction, there are problems with extensivity and stuff like that. It's not a very sort of uh, <laughs> thermodynamically a very nice uh, sort of uh, potential. Okay, so this I, 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 I'm not going to repeat. That's a phase diagram of a fluid. And our basic phase ordering problem I indicated as follows. Uh, you have a bunch of atomic spins. Energetically, the spins like to align parallel. Uh, entropically, they like to point dynamically with respect to each other. Free energy is E minus TS something. So if T is large enough, entropy wins out to minimize the free energy. If T is small enough, then energy wins out to minimize the free energy. So that's that's what dictates the space diagram. The experimentalist has the option of sitting anywhere in this plane. And uh, at high temperatures, she finds a paramagnetic phase. And at low temperatures, she finds ferromagnetic phases. If you have a positive field, it's just the up phase, uh, all the spins pointing up. If you have, I should say all the spins pointing up, let's be very clear on this. Uh, at zero temperature, all the spins point either up uh, or down. At non-zero temperatures, you have some impurity spins in the domains because the magnetization doesn't saturate out to its, uh, its uh, sort of uh, perfect value. But that apart, you have an up spontaneously broken symmetry as you come below the critical temperature. And if you're sitting on this line in particular, you don't have a magnetic field, then there's nothing to choose between the up and the down phase. And these compete with each other, and that's what we've been spending a lot of time. Yes, please. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I would say the terms are, I mean, if you think in free energy language, they are balanced at the critical point, right? So it's E minus TS, so the terms are sort of relatively important, and uh, neither of them wins out. So you have uh, zero magnetization, but you are spontaneous, you are in a magnetized phase with zero magnetization. That's the way to put it. That's that's actually what happens at the critical point. I mean, if the correlation lens becomes infinity, and the system becomes highly cooperative as a matter of fact. Uh, I I think you will calculate that the entropy maximum is not at the critical point. The entropy maximum is at infinite temperature. When you have a random configuration of ups and down spins, then you have two raised to power n configurations for n spins, and uh, the entropy is the maximum at infinite temperature. And then, which is intuitively sort of uh, uh, reasonably uh, clear like this. Okay? But uh, anyway, so, so, so the dynamics problem I'm going to consider, I have been considering, is a sudden quench from the paramagnetic phase up here at high temperature. To below the critical temperature, and I've already told you that the purity of the domains that form will be dictated by how deep you are below the critical temperature, basically. Okay, but that, that that's a sort of a relatively minor point. Okay, so this is the, my first snapshot of uh, phase uh, ordering dynamics. This is also the picture that uh, what, what's it? Debrach, Debrach, uh, he showed the movie of this. So what you do is you here. This is a simulation of a Glauber Isaac model. I don't have these sharp edges because it's a much larger system. Uh, there you will see the effects of the pixels. Do you remember the system size over there? Uh, I think it's 1024 squared or something. It's very straightforward. The simulations are very straightforward. Yeah. 
So you start off in the paramagnetic phase at time t equal to zero. Time is measured in terms of Monte Carlo steps out here. At time t equal to zero, you have a random mix of up spins and down spins. And then you develop domains. The domains are equivalent. Up spin rich are black, white spin rich are white, uh, 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 white are down spin rich. As time goes on, both sets of domains grow and grow and grow. And as a matter of fact, if you have an infinite system, this pattern replication continues forever. There's no reason why it should come to a stop. But in a finite system, finally one of the domains wins out. And at t equal to infinity, you go either into the up phase or the down phase. The time, the time required to be in only one phase, that has some independence. It has some system size dependence, yeah. Well, the length scale goes as t raised to power half. So if you have a system of size uh, L, L squared would be the typical time to relax to the finite size uh, infinity. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, now uh, uh, we've written, we've spent a lot of time uh, deriving equations for this. Uh, I wrote out the master equation for global kinetics. I derived the uh, sort of a uh, 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 TDGL equation which applies in this case. And I also told you that the TDGL equation is not analytically tractable. Okay. So the next set of things we did was have approximations. The next thing, set of things we did was find approximate solutions of the TDGL equation from this random initial condition. And for that, the concept that's very handy is the first one that the domain growth is driven by the system's desire to get rid of these interfaces or domain walls, basically. Okay, So these are what are called defects in the system. Defect is normally a negative word, but in condensed matter physics or well, in physics, defect is a very nice thing. Okay. So I'm going to use the defects as a handle to capture this pattern formation process. That's the basis of which I wrote down the Allen Kahn equation, which again is intuitively sort of clear that the local velocity at the point A is proportional to the curvature. So for example, this guy that is popping out is going to go in. This guy that is popping in is going to come out. The interface is locally going to become flat. And then as time goes on, the interface will finally go away. Okay. But as you've seen, that flat interfaces are very stable, uh, as, as you saw in, in Debrage's movie, basically. Okay. But uh, so, so that's the sort of uh, Alan Kahn equation for the non conserved problem. And you can very simply do dimensional analysis on this. Uh, if the length scale is L as a function of time, the velocity of the interfaces is just dl by dt, and the curvature is 1 over l. If you have a droplet of infinite size, you have no curvature as a matter of fact, right? Huh? So, so that curvature goes to 0 for a droplet of infinite size, which is, of course, the same as a flat interface, right? So, and this you integrate up, and you get the first sort of non trivial result that the length scale goes with time as the square root of time. And the scale is set by the surface tension. Basically, the surface tension is what drives the, the system. Okay. Uh, the next set of things which I mentioned only in passing, but uh, let's sort of flesh that idea out a little more now because it's important, is that the system shows dynamical scaling. Now, dynamical scaling is a concept we have imported from critical dynamics. Remember, I told you first people studied. Uh, equilibrium critical phenomena at the critical point. Then they studied dynamic critical phenomena at the critical point. And now we are studying far from equilibrium phenomena away from the critical point. Okay, but we're using the same models as the guys in critical dynamics used, basically. And uh, so this dynamical scaling context, the concept basically says that the length and the time scales are related to each other in critical dynamics. Here, what it means is the following. If you calculate the correlation function of the order parameter, so you have some magnetization here and some magnetization here, you calculate the correlation function of the order parameter. In general, of course, it's a non equilibrium process. So it depends on the spatial distance between the two points. 
and it also depends on the time. The system is changing with time. But dynamical scaling is a statement that it's a collapsed function of the distance r divided by the length scale. And again, intuitively, the way I would argue this is you have a ruler. The size of the ruler is changing with time. And the size of the ruler is all that's changing in these patterns. That's that's the physical statement out here, basically. Okay. So L is the typical domain size. It's also the typical distance between domains, naturally. And what I'm saying in when I'm talking about dynamical scaling, you are saying that this pattern is statistically similar to this pattern. All that's changed is your ruler length has changed with time. So this is the paradigm I want you to sort of have a good handle of, okay? And then we can use this uh, Osaka-Gastau-Kamasaki auxiliary field, which I explain only very sketchily, but but uh, I hope uh, uh, you can find more in my notes, uh, which are distributed. You actually find that the correlation function has this dynamical scaling form. The length scale just becomes a ruler for the distance between two points. This is called the Uta Jasto Kawasaki function. And uh, a very nice feature of this, which uh, experimentalists had known for a while, is that it has what's called a four-odd tail. The four-odd tail has been very significant in domain growth studies. The four-odd tail is basically the statement that the structure factor at large wave vectors, remember the structure factor is what to measure. Uh, when you shine a beam of uh, light or neutrons or let's say it's what they want okay? So uh, that is, uh, globally as theorists, we look at this correlation function. So that is just the Fourier transform of that. So if you know one, you know the other, basically. But the consequence of this function, uh, of the OJK function, is that at large wave vectors, it decays as a power law singularity with the momentum. Here is for minus dimensionality plus one. Okay. Uh, and uh, why is this surprising? Well, it's it's a bit surprising because normally structure factor tails go exponentially uh, uh, in a Gaussian manner or some something in large wave vectors. And the singularity out here, the singular structure out here, is a consequence of scattering of sharp interfaces. The sharp interfaces are uh, these sort of boundaries between up and down strings, basically. Okay, so you see a precise four-odd law if it's a step function, and if there's it's a sort of little more gradual, then you see a softening of the four-odd law. But it goes over to the four-odd law when the length scale of the interface becomes uh, irrelevant compared to the length scale of the interface. Okay, I just want to say that four-odd had nothing to do with domain growth. So his name is on this law. Porod was a, some guy in the 50s who was interested in scattering from porous rocks. Are you familiar with porous rocks? Huh? When you bathe, well, I don't know whether you guys use it, but in younger days, I would sort of use it for score. Huh? You use it to clean your feet and stuff like that. Maybe you guys are more sophisticated things now. <laughs> so pumice stone is an example of a porous rock. And a porous rock is something that has boundaries sharp boundaries between rock and air for a region. So Polar observed it in that context. Uh, I, I, I hope you realize that uh, uh, where would polar rocks be interesting? Any idea? Where would polar rocks be interesting? Population certainly. But give me an industrial application. Hmm? Oil pouring, exactly. You sort of apply pressure from one side and you give it disappointed if oil doesn't come out at the other end, right? So you want to do what porous rocks do. There's a perfectly good reason for porous to study it. But the same porous law arises because of the scattering of the sharp interfaces here with corrections due to, uh, uh, remember uh, we had an interface. So uh, just let me remind you that uh, the typical kink is like that. The interface width is just the correlation length. I had calculated it explicitly. It was square root 2 in dimension as units. Uh, so there is a time-dependent length scale out here. 
you have a Polar's law and connections to it which are a function of xi over L. Okay, and you can actually calculate the connections. And of course, as L goes to infinity, xi uh, becomes irrelevant, and then you recover a precise Polar's law. This is also the same reason why uh, noise is asymptotically irrelevant. Noise is asymptotically irrelevant because it just changes the thickness of the interface, basically. Okay, and uh, so it just takes later to get to the regime where the interface is irrelevant. Okay, but but these are sort of good physics concepts to have under uh, under your belt. Okay, uh, the next set of statements I want to make. Is a system I refer to in passing, but now I want to discuss it in greater detail because this is uh, uh, an area where I have contributed. And here one is talking of the ordering of a superconductor or a superfluid from the normal state. Okay, so I, I mean, we all familiar superconductivity is one of the greatest uh, sort of uh, uh, phenomena of physics, right? It's, it's uh, absolutely beautiful phenomena. What happens in superconductivity? At normal temperatures, a metal is normal, has resistance, and then if you cool it below a critical temperature, it becomes superconducting. Huh? And this is, this is actually a, a quantum mechanics at play in, in, in these materials. It's, it's, it's very beautiful. Okay, so this is also an example of a phase transition in our language. Okay. But uh, I'll try to sort of explain to you what the nature of the phase transition is. But when you go from a normal phase to a superconducting phase, you have a phase transition. And I now want to understand what is the kinetics of that phase transition. Okay, That's the subject of my next set of pictures. And uh, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes explaining those pictures, basically. Okay, So what am I looking at? In some coding, I'm looking at the ordering of a superconductor. Uh, this requires a certain amount of uh, sort of uh, explaining, so just bear with me, please. Okay. So look at the one. Uh, the super state is described by a, I mean, not just a super state. The system is described by a wave function, right? It's a quantum mechanical system. Okay. So it has a well. At the first place, a order parameter is a complex quantity. It's not a real quantity. So you immediately see it's a two-component quantity. Okay. That's one statement. And in the Ginsburg Landau theory of superconductivity, which I referred to, uh, this phase is incoherent in the normal phase and it becomes the same everywhere in the order, in the superconductivity. Okay? That's the phase transition that takes place in Ginsburg. So there's a BCS theory, which is a microscopic theory, won a Nobel Prize. And then there's the Ginsburg Landau theory, and Ginsburg also, of course, won the Nobel Prize uh, for that theory. Okay, uh, that's at the phenomenological order parameter base level. Okay, so now the phase transition in this language, so you have an amplitude that doesn't matter too much, but you have a phase factor which is incoherent. You have random angles all over the place in the normal phase, and coherent, you have the same phase function everywhere. Across a macroscopic system, think of how remarkable that is, right? And that's what gives rise to flow without any current. I mean, uh, if you're not familiar with this phenomenon, you certainly need to understand uh, because it's one of the most beautiful things in physics. Okay, now what is the kinetics of that phase transition? So theta is going to go from random in the normal phase to the, after the quench, it will become coherent. Okay, so you start off with a uh, random which what these colors indicate is two three small windows of the phase angle so maybe i think this is worth writing down on the board so the colors indicate three windows of the phase angle the precise windows don't matter but let me sort of give you an idea so let's say one color refers to a small window 2 pi by 3 to 2 pi two by 3 per epsilon. Let's say that's uh, red. Then black refers to black refers to theta lying in the window 4 pi by 3 to 4 pi by 3 
plus epsilon. And what was my third color? Green. Green refers to the phase line between 2 pi to 2 pi plus epsilon, which is just the same as 0 to 0 plus epsilon. Okay. Uh, uh, the point is the following that you have a wave function everywhere in the system, and because you have a wave function, you have some phase angle everywhere in the system. Okay. I have only colored these three small windows, and that's what I've indicated on this plot out here. Uh, so, what you start off with an incoherent sort of uh, initial phase angle, and then you start to see development of order, order, it continues to order and orders. And I draw your attention to this junction point of the three colors. Okay, what happens at the junction point? If you go around this junction point, you pick up a phase of 2 pi, which corresponds to a vortex defect. Earlier, I had interfacial defects. Now, the defects are vortices, basically. Okay? Uh, if it rotates in the minus, so earlier you had kinks and anti kinks. Here you have vortices and anti vortices. Okay? And the process of phase ordering of the superconductor, now I can sort of say it uh, in physics terms is the annealing random walk of these vortices and anti-vortices. You can see a collision taking place right here, as a matter of fact. Huh? Two are about to merge and disappear. And the formation of larger and larger vortices uh, in this process. Okay? So the paradigm is exactly the same as earlier. You have a, 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 a things and things doing random walks, colliding, making larger domains. Here the defects and the uh, vortices and the anti-vortices are performing random walks and making larger and larger vortices in this process. Yeah, please. Plus one, minus one, how do you know if you have the Again, it's just a question of setting a convention. Let's say you, uh, uh, I mean, clockwise, you go clockwise. If you pick up plus two pi, then it's, a, let's say, vortex. If you pick up minus two pi, it's an anti. Okay. Yeah, because uh, these are three different, these colors are three different phase angles, widely separated. Uh, if I indicated all the phase angles by color, then this entire thing would be covered with color. I just picked three small windows. Obviously, the junction point of those uh, colors is up there where the phase rotates. You want to create a vortex in your bathroom, fill up the sink. And uh, uh, pull the plug. Okay, the water will drain out, and at the end, will create a nice vortex. So vortex is a very universal structure in the nature as a matter of fact. Vortices and anti vortices, and here you see they drive the phase transition of uh, of uh, uh, they drive the superconducting phase transition. Okay, so now you see this idea. Uh, this is the work uh, uh, I did uh, many years ago with Alan Bray at Manchester. Using this idea, we found that the growth law of the vortices with time, earlier you had the growth law of domains with time, now your growth law of the vortices is generically p raised to power half with a logarithmic connection which I told you about in b equal to 2, where it's a point defect. Okay. When b is equal to the number of components of the order parameter, you have what's called a point defect. Uh, Perhaps uh, more significantly, we showed that the system scales dynamically, which now you know what that statement means. It means that the order parameter, which uh, a correlation function, which in general is a function of space and time, is a function of this collapsed variable. This L just becomes a ruler length for the pattern, basically. So this pattern is statistically similar to this pattern. All that's changed is that the scale of the pattern has changed, basically. Okay? And we actually obtained this function. Uh, it's a sort of ugly looking hypergeometric function that doesn't matter so much. The important point is it dynamically scales. And the very nice thing we found was that there's a very cute generalization of the Porod tail. Remember earlier the Porod tail was k is for minus dimensionality plus one. We actually solve the problem for all order of defects. So n is the uh, all order of uh, order parameter. 
So n is the number of components in the order parameter. For the super tactic problem, it's two. For the scalar problem, it's one. For monopoles, it's three, and so on and so forth. And we actually found that the Borot tail generalizes nicely as k raised to power minus dimensionality plus n, where n is the number of components in the order parameter. Okay, so it's a nice cute generalization. And uh, of course, it goes back to the older Borot law when you have n equal to 1. Okay, so this was actually observed uh, some years after we made the prediction. And the first people who did these experiments were guys at Bell Labs uh, who were working with the quantity of liquid crystals. Okay, so in liquid crystals, though I haven't used that term so far, liquid crystals of phase transition is exactly the same. Does everybody know what a liquid crystal is? You use it every day, right? Huh? In all your displays. I don't know, maybe people use LED displays now. But anyway, liquid crystals are a bunch of rod shaped molecules. Energetically, the rod shaped molecules like to align parallel. Uh, and tropically, they like to be randomly oriented with respect to each other. So, uh, the uh, random orientation is called the isotropic phase, the disordered phase. And the aligned uh, uh, phase is called the nematic phase. And isotropic nematic switching is very important in a host of applications, basically. So, this is the kinetics of phase transition also of the liquid crystal. I start from the isotropic phase, I quench it at time t equal to 0 into a, where it would like to be a nematic phase. These are now actually not phase angles, they are actually angles the rod is making, physical angles that the rod is making. And you have these vortices actually, it's a little more complicated because you have half vortices and half, you have half defects in liquid crystals. Because usually the rods are polar, that means there's, there's an up-down symmetry, there's no distinction between up and down. Although you can also have polar liquid crystals, but they're usually apolar. But anyway, that's also important. So again, the ordering proceeds by the same uh, mechanism uh, of annihilation of vortices and anti-vortices. And we've checked that the same dynamical scaling scenario applies there also. Again, we switch language. I, if you remember, like 10 years ago, everybody was talking about Higgs bosons and so on and so forth, right? And there was always this line in the newspaper that the Higgs boson gives mass to the particular particles in electroweak theory, okay? The mechanism whereby it gives mass is exactly the same mechanism as applies in superconductivity. So, Namu, who was the guy who came up with that idea uh, for particle physics, imported the idea from the BCS theory. Exactly the same symmetry breaking applies where you have a double bell potential earlier in the, in the Higgs boson case, you have what's called a sombrero potential. How to explain what a sombrero potential is, huh? Uh, have you have you seen these Mexican hacks? So earlier we had a double well potential, right? Like that. Oh sorry, not drawn very well. Okay. The sombrero is if you just rotate this around by two pi. So you have actually, a, I mean, now this sort of, uh, that's what's called a sombrero, okay? And uh, the symmetry breaking in, in, in that sombrero uh, gives you sort of, uh, gives you the, uh, 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 gives you the sort of uh, uh, this mechanism by, by which mass is transferred. A couple of important points to note out here is that the phase transition occurs to a phase with uniform theta. But theta has a degeneracy, it can lie anywhere from 0 to 2 pi. In the previous case, it could be either point in the up direction or in the down direction. But in this case, theta can lie anywhere on the face of a clock, basically. So it's a sort of richer set of ground states. And basically what that means is that you can sit anywhere in the rim of this sombrero. Okay? Uh, the system finally after breaking symmetry. Yeah. Matter of details, what uh, type of, what is the value of epsilon in this figure? Epsilon would be a very small 0.1 or 0.1. 0.1 degree. Ah, 0.1 degree. Yeah. Yes, second normal is, suppose now I add another color. Yeah. On, on this picture, I yeah. add another color, the fourth color, say from pi to pi plus epsilon. Okay. So will these uh, junctions having three uh, colors, they will become four? Now yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's exactly. Exactly. And if I finally add colors for all the different windows, then this entire space would be filled out because there has to be some phase angle everywhere. So, just for visualizing the 
this is for visualizing yeah. so then every point every junction point will be suppose there i have 360 colors okay if i tell the colors if you include all the window all the angles in this windows if you have enough colors to code all the windows then the entire space will be covered because everywhere there has to be some value of the face. But there will be these junctions will be special points. The but all points special will be points. Junctions. Not all of them will be junctions. No. I mean, uh, yeah, you, you see junction out here. If you add another color, then you'll probably have another arm sort of coming out from there and so on and so forth. Because if you rotate around the junction, you sample, all, that's the singularity, you sample all the phase values and you rotate around the junction. So finally, we end up with a single color. Finally, you end up with a single all color, or all white. Or, well, all white or all some color. Yeah. Huh. But now there's a degeneracy zero to two pi, so you can have ten degrees, you can have eighty degrees. Yeah. Every everything, like in a ferromagnet, everything points parallel. But now you have a more choice of states in which you can point parallel. Yeah. So what is the energy order current? One thing I think. No, no, the other one is just the fact that it's a complex wave function. So you, I mean, uh, if you, uh, this is described by what's called the dynamical xy model. So the psi in my PDGL equation now becomes a vector psi, a two component psi. The real and the imaginary parts of the wave function. Yeah. In terms of theta, it seems like there is one order parameter. No, no, it's not one order parameter, it's two order parameters because you have e super i theta. It was cos theta plus i sin theta. <laughs> yeah. But they are, they are not independent, right? Cos and sin, they are not independent. Uh, uh, well, uh, you can determine one from the other if the magnitude is fixed. But the magnitude may not be fixed. At the core of these vortices, the amplitude actually goes to zero. So the amplitude is non zero only far away from the center of the vortex. It's exactly the same paradigm as earlier. Earlier, the interfaces were the points where the order parameter became zero. Now, the defect cores are the points where the order parameter becomes zero. Basically. But this is a type 1 stop. Right? <laughs> I always forget which is which. Type 1 superconductor. It's the Gisbert Langlau theory for type 1 superconductor. Uh, so, you said we have a huge amount of degeneracy, and basically, when we do a Langlau. So the Goldstone mode is the fact that you can move freely anywhere in the rim of this hat without any change of energy. That's what's called the Goldstone. Yes. Yeah. But then having superconductor basically means we are destroying that degeneracy. Obviously. And then we are. No, no, you're not destroying the degeneracy. You're just picking one of the directions. Yeah, yeah. You have a coherent wave function. You have the macroscopically the same wave function. Right. And the superconducting phase, and Feynman discusses this very nicely in his lectures, is a consequence of the fact that you have a macroscopic wave function. Right. Right. It's uh, like the only quantum mechanical effect. It can't happen in the uh, 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 right. Like condensation. Yeah. Uh, so how uh, I'm still a bit. Uh, I mean, if you do it, if you can like tell me what does that? Uh, how how is it reflected in that diagram? How is what reflected? That phase transition. That phase transition at the end of the day in a finite system, I will become the same color everywhere. Uh, it could be one of these three colors, or it need, need not be one of these three colors because the phase may not lie in this window. I haven't covered the entire window. And, uh, so if I mark all the windows, then I have let's say 30 colors. Yeah, yeah. Then it will become one of those 30 colors at the end when the symmetry is broken. You have now picked up preferential direction to point in. But if you do the experiment a hundred times, the next time you'll pick another theta, the third time you'll pick another theta, and so on and so forth. You imagine a box of chalks. It's much easier to think of a box of chalks. The chalks want to align parallel. It doesn't matter whether they align parallel like that or align parallel like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. What I meant to say is uh, so the kinetics is uh, reflected in the fact. That the vortices would be marginal, right? The vortices would be marginal. Will be merging, exactly. Yeah. Be, uh, the vortices and the anti-vortices. See, earlier what was happening 
the domain this was guy was doing a random walk this guy was doing a random walk as they were merging and growing exactly the same thing is happening out here except the uh, the elementary particle is the vortex that's and we capture the dynamics in terms of the so vortex the dynamics itself suggests that it will be one of them it will be one of the colors or one of the yeah i mean that's the broken that's when the phase transition is complete it's got to be one of the colors I already can see the four sign, right? I mean, the perfect then the ten and five are there. Yeah. So look at the black. The dead. You can see the density of vortices here is much larger than the density of vortices here. And this process will continue with time. And as a matter of fact, not just if you solve it for, for the superconducting case, Brain I actually solved it for an arbitrary n component order parameter. Okay. So it applies for monopoles which are important in orbit in the early universe and so on and so forth. So we have a collective theory. Still of the non-conserved case. This is also a non-conserved problem. So ultimately you point in one direction everything. So Sanjay, I mean one, isn't it better to put arrows? Uh arrow theta like I mean theta arrow represent represents a particular theta. Yeah. It's oh. like XY model. Uh, yeah. So then you, I know one yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just the XY model. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. Arrows would probably be better, yeah. I mean, like, this picture a long time no, ago. Right, right. Now, the second yeah. question is that you said something is not possible classically. So, what is that? So, that superconductivity is not possible. No, superconductivity is not possible, but you said superfluidity is also not well, superfluidity is also not possible classically. I said you can't have a macroscopic wave function and you need the macroscopic wave function to. Well, I mean, uh, it means that how do you define superfluidity? I mean, in either way, uh, I mean, both Einstein condensation is. I mean, you can see real space condensation. I mean, well, okay, but I mean, uh, it's not old function sense, but yeah. it's a condensation. But I'm, I'm saying in the experimental sense of the word. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not in the, I mean, in theory, one can, uh, yeah, get some realization which resembles that when I'm talking of the experiment uh, on this. Subject. And uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, mm. uh, superfluidity, so I mean, uh, the things we discussed yesterday. So yeah. In, even in the classical system, for example, self proper particles, mm. you can see huge current fluctuations. That's, 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 I mean, uh, like the macroscopic, like macroscopic, macroscopic like particles, like, so like the, yeah. Okay. Super cool. Fair enough. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? So, that finishes my story of the non conserved case. And now we finally sort of start looking at the second class of problems in the last half an hour or so. Which are much more poorly understood than the first class of problems, the non conserved problems. Okay, so let's forget about anisotropic growth and uh, I mean, this is all stuff we've done. Let's come to part C, which is now the dynamics of phase separation. Okay? What is the dynamics of phase separation? Again, let's get the experimental phenomena clear first and then we talk about the theoretical modeling. So you have a binary mixture and uh, it's convenient to use a term oil and water. But as with my previous example, I use a term, but it applies to a whole variety of different systems. So you can have polymer mixtures, the brass is a zinc copper mixture, you can have ternary mixtures, you can have four component mixtures, and engineers have all sorts of mixtures. Uh, and if you look at some of the phase diagrams and metallurgy books, you go just crazy, I think. It's almost impossible to understand those phase diagrams, even if you're a theoretical physicist who knows that stuff. Okay? Okay. Uh, again, what is the paradigm? Equilibrium paradigm is that oil and water like to phase separate energetically. Oil would like to sit with oil, water would like to sit with water. Okay. Entropically, they like to mix up. Okay. So the appropriate description of that is in, with the Ising model again, but it's not the Ising model in a fixed magnetic field ensemble. It's an Ising model with a fixed Magnetization ensemble. So far, we have been working uh, in uh, the so the binary mixture. So the ferromagnet was studied in the THN ensemble. The binary mixture is studied in the TMN ensemble. The magnetization is fixed. Why is the magnetization fixed? Because the number of upstrings and downstrings is fixed. So the difference is the magnetization, and that is fixed for a binary mixture. Okay, it's a subtle point, but not many students appreciate it, so I just want to emphasize it. 
because when the phase diagram actually looks quite different, where you had a first order line along x equal to 0, that opens into this uh, region of a coexistence curve, basically. Okay. And, uh, I mean, I, if you recall your Van der Waals equation of state, uh, coexistence lines become coexistence regions, basically. What I'm plotting here is the fraction of oil. It goes from zero, of no oil, to one, uh, all oil. And uh, corresponding to the fraction of water goes from one, all water, to zero, all oil. So that's it. There's just two components in the mixture. And it's described by the spin half uh, 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 Isaac model. At high temperatures, you are in the homogeneous phase up here. And at low temperatures, you are in the phase separated phase. Uh, you can't sit down here if you recall the Van der Waals equation of state. You will phase separate into a component that is rich in this phase. Suppose you come down to this temperature. You will phase separate into a component that is rich in that and a component which is rich in that. I think this goes under the name of Gibbs lever rule or something. I said it's sort of been around for a while. Maybe not Gibbs, Maxwell lever rule. Maxwell, 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 Maxwell is a construction, right, basically. Okay. So you can't you can't live in here. So now now you know what the kinetics experiment is. I start off with my homogeneous oil water mixture. I rapidly quench it down and I ask what is the kinetics whereby this phase separation will proceed. How do I describe it in terms of kinetic ice model? I use Ising model, no kinetics of its own, with Kawasaki kinetics, with exchange kinetics. Okay. Spin one now means oil, spin minus one means water. Okay. And when you interchange spins, you preserve the number of oil and water components. Okay. You can use that as a basis of a master equation. It's actually derived in the notes I've distributed. It, it will take a little longer than like with the BGL equation. But at the end of the day, you end up with this Carl Hilliard equation, which I wrote down earlier, or model B. Okay. So, so that's the level of uh, at the level of modeling this phenomenon. Okay. So now I let me just again give you pictures and sort of explain the physics of what's going on. So remember, I've started there somewhere and rapidly quenched down and now I'm going to have to worry about what is the magnetization of the system i.e. what is the composition of uh, oil and water I and mean, how much oil or water is there so let's start off with a simple case we well, are not so simple case actually let's start off with a, what's called a critical quench in a crit critical quench you have 50% of oil and 50% of water so you just come down like that basically Okay, I've also put these dashed lines in the phase diagram, which I'll refer to later. Don't worry about these lines uh, out here. Okay, for the moment, this is the phase boundary. Not for the moment, this is the phase boundary. That's it. The solid curve, and the engineers call it visibility gap. That, that's the sort of term they use. Okay, here's a picture of the kinetics of phase separation in a critical mixture. Now modeled either via the Carnier equation or via Kawasaki IC model, right? Uh, you can, I hope you can sort of code that up very easy. It's, it's very straightforward to code up. At time t equal to zero, I start off with a random mix of oil and water. So I have black, white, interspersed with each other. As time goes on, I phase separate. I develop domains which are rich in oil, that's the black regions, and domains which are rich in water, which are the white regions. And as we have seen before, the domains grow, and they grow, and they grow. Finally, phase separation is complete. I don't get all oil or all water. I get 50% oil block, 50% water block. Okay. So again, the game is the same. I want to get rid of these defects which cause me surface tension. But uh, I, here I can only do it. I have to live with at least one defect. Well, I think you have periodic boundary condition, two defects at the end of it. Okay. So, so, so but, but that's a minor point, uh, so you face separate. And the crucial thing out here is that the composition must be conserved during the evolution, not just in the final state, but also during the evolution. So in this case, unlike the previous case, uh, take, uh, consider this droplet out here, for example. This droplet, okay, start off with the droplet at t equal to 500, okay? 
So I've got this largest droplet out here. This droplet has diminished by this time. What, what is the physics that has happened? It's not just like the spins have flipped because they're no longer allowed to flip. This domain has evaporated, transported through water, and gone on deposited on a larger domain of oil somewhere else. Okay. So this is what's called evaporation condensation. It's also known in the engineering as Ostwald lightning. That's a term. Uh, even guys, our guys who blow nano crystals, nano particles, and all that, they use Ostwald lightning a lot. Okay. So this is the evaporation condensation, and you can see by this time it's totally disappeared. So these guys keep evaporating and depositing. So the rule is that the smaller droplets are eaten by larger droplets, and the larger droplets are eaten by yet larger droplets, and so on and so forth. That happens in life also sometimes. Right? You start off with 10 phone companies, and then the smaller phone companies get eaten up by the larger phone companies. Actually, it's not a very dissimilar process. There are such models. Uh, I mean, uh, in Calcutta, Vikas Chakrabarti is one of the experts on using these kind of models for social situations and economic situations, okay? But we'll stick to uh, engineering. Is total length of the perimeter? Yeah. Reduces. 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 Yes. Total length is reduced. So ultimately, you go to just one interface, hopefully a flat interface. So the uh, number of plus minus pairs. Yeah. So they also... Definition. You have to always go down in the free energy lines. Huh? But it's just that because of the conservation constraint, you have to live with at least one interface. Okay, the growth is also slower. Uh, uh, the growth is driven by the gradient of the chemical potential. The chemical potential on a droplet is 1 over L, the typical domain size. Uh, a droplet of infinite size has zero chemical potential. I already told you that before. The scale of the gradient is another 1 over L. So now you have an L squared down there. And this gives you L uh, going as T raised for one third. So it's a slower growth process than it was in the observed case. I should add a couple of things. This is only for diffusive growth. Okay. If you added hydrodynamic effects, like in oil water phase separation, you open up other avenues of transport. Okay. Uh, uh, fluids can transport material faster than diffusively, and then you get a crossover in various laws. But for the moment, let's stick with T risk for one third for diffusive growth, and this is known as the lipschitz uh growth law. Okay. Again, the system shows dynamical scaling. That's all obvious looking at the pictures. This guy is statistically similar to that guy. It's just a blown up version of that, okay? But we don't know the form of the scaling function. Unlike in the previous case, where I have a pretty good approximate theory, I can't write down a corresponding Khan Allen equation. I can write it out, but it's not much use. Uh, and I can't linearize the equation by going to auxiliary fields and so on and so forth. And this is the, what I mentioned earlier. The problem this uh, in this guy is the following. And earlier, the interface is just sort of wiggled locally and went in or out. Okay. And that a random walk was a good enough description for that. Now, as I uh, as I said earlier, if this interface wants to go in, all the other interfaces have to readjust so as to conserve the composition, 50 50 composition. Much harder problem, which we have not been able to solve so far. As I said, the original work of Richard Sliozov actually solved the problem where one of the components is there in a vanishing fraction. Yes? I have a question like this how you know It applies to a larger number of components as long as the growth is diffusing. If you include hydrodynamics, then other growth laws come into play, which are also universal for hydrodynamics. Well, the, yeah, but it's a question of whether the growth law becomes slower or the prefactor becomes slower. So the prefactor usually becomes less. But the, the growth law remains is pretty robust. Both the theories for half and theories for one third are robust across many, many systems, which is why I made this statement that we have a universality. It depends only on the nature of defects and the conservation laws that apply. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
person condemns mechanism and help its own mechanism incorporated into the dynamics. Because uh, when we are uh, doing something of this type, we conserve models, uh, it becomes physically difficult to explain that uh, how this information is being carried. Say one is getting smaller and somewhere else is. Okay, you want to go down the free energy uh, curve. You want to evolve in configurations that reduce the free energy. Okay, and it's clear that the only way you can do it is by reducing the number of interfaces. Okay, so the system finds its own way to reduce interfaces and will willy nilly transport black to other black and make one large black and one large white. Okay. Be that by evaporation condensation, be that by hydrodynamics, whatever, ultimately it will do the transportation. Huh? And I, I mean, yeah, you can imagine that this guy evaporates, transports to water, and goes on deposits for the larger droplet of oil somewhere else. It's not so sort of uh, unlikely, right? Huh? Or it happens in a binary alloy or some such thing. Okay. Any other questions? Finally, yeah. Finally, Line, yeah, but I mean, in a simulation, you might not realize a straight line, but ideally, it should be a straight line, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, whatever it doesn't matter. Sorry? Because the diagonal will be easier. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. I mean, <laughs> that's a finite size effect. Yeah, okay, so horizontal. Okay. And you have two interfaces if you have periodic boundaries. If you have anti periodic, then you have only one. Okay, yeah. So, is it so that uh, with decreasing number of boundaries, both the conjunct and the non-conjunct models decreasing number of boundaries. No, they are not the same at all. Uh, the limit in which they become the same is instead of nearest neighbor Kawasaki exchange, if you allow for global exchange, you can have the following kind of conserved model where you pick up a spin from here and interchange it with a spin there. That still nominally conserves the magnetization. Okay. So it describes the conserved process, but that conservation law is not effective at all. So the glow poles in that case are it goes over to the non-conserved problem effectively. Okay. So there is one conserved quantity, the overall composition. That's the limit which is going to form. But in that case, the system you're dealing with is still non-conserved. Which one? Even if you are exchanging with a global thing. No, it's not all conserved. You pick up a plus pin here and a minus pin there and you interchange them. You are visualizing that system, right? In, like in, in that uh, microscopic system, it is not conserved. I don't understand better. What are you saying? Huh? Number of spins are conserved. Number of spins is conserved, right? If you pick up a plus pin here and a minus pin there. But if you do it across a large distance, what I'm saying is the conservation law does not play a major role in determining the dynamics. That's the statement. Effectively non conserved. Yeah. The usual Kawasaki spin exchange is where you interchange nearest neighbors. See, the, I mean, it's always good to think of these things physically. Okay. Uh, physically, what's happening? Let's say you're looking at a binary alloy, copper and zinc. Okay. Now, obviously, you can't have a copper atom here and a zinc atom disappear here and suddenly reappear. They go to the physically impossible. So, what happens is this happens through vacancies. Okay. The small, a lot. Some small fraction of vacancies in the system, the copper moves into the vacancy, the zinc moves into the state, and so on and so forth. Okay. So it's, it's all happening at the local level. It, you can't have a copper jump from here and go into a vacancy sort of uh, a centimeter away or something. So he said uh, Kawasaki is near a stable exchange, but if you just theoretically consider this global exchange, then it's not like having a conservation law at all. You started with the mean field premises, right? but this exponent uh, depends on interactions. Or... As long as the nearest neighbor interaction, you will reduce one principle. Yeah. Yes, if you allow for long range power law interactions, then other growth laws so apply. It only depends on dimension and the process itself. And the, or whether you have conservation or not. Right. Conservation whether you have hydrodynamics or not. Mm -hmm. But these are very sort of generic, generic statements. Right. And a uh, whole lot of systems would sort of uh, uh, same. okay. Okay, uh, last set of statements. Uh, I, I guess you should really sort of stop for some questions. Uh, you don't have to, in this case, you don't have to consider 50-50 quench. 
you could consider 30 70 quench say you have the opposition of oil 30 percent so you quench from here to here huh uh, now i want to make a point about this dash line what is this dash line uh, metallurgists distinguish between nucleation and growth and spinodal decomposition okay spinodal decomposition is the following statement that if you quench down here you spontaneously phase separate okay that's spinodal decomposition whereas if you quench into this region out here this liver or this liver you don't spontaneously phase separate you don't roll down the hill you need a kick to get out. I showed you this picture in yesterday's lecture, right? So you need a kick to get out of the uh, out of the local minimum, basically. Okay. But uh, I think uh, I mean uh, my, my colleague Binder was one of the world experts on nucleation, and he used to call this claim that the distinction is artificial. There is no phase boundary there. I, I want to emphasize that. Yeah. So so he would emphasize that the distinction between nucleation and spinodal decomposition is an artifact of nucleation. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to bounce that off you. Uh, but the engineers nevertheless continue to sort of uh, rather religiously distinguish between quenches here and quenches in here, basically. Okay? I mean, uh, the way to look at it is if you have, in BQ theory, you don't have any fluctuations. So if you're stuck in a local minima, you'll be stuck there forever. Okay? But as soon as you turn on fluctuations on some time scale, you're going to escape. And then once phase separation starts, it starts. It doesn't matter. You'll have the same evolution and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's a picture of phase separation of off critical mixtures 30% oil, 70% water. You start off with a random mix of oil and water out here. And uh, then you phase separate into uh, small droplets of oil in a matrix of water in a background of water the droplets grow and they grow and they grow nice spherical droplets in this case actually okay and finally as time t goes to infinity you have one large blob of 30 percent oil and one large blob of 70 percent water because that composition must be conserved and again the rule the physics is the same the chemical potential is higher on uh, smaller droplets so the smaller droplets evaporate, transport to the larger droplets, join them. The larger droplets evaporate, transport to yet larger droplets and join them. And finally, at the end of the day, one mega droplet emerges from the system. Okay. So the spaghetti-like pattern is only at 50-50. The bicontinuous pattern is only at 50-50. Only at 50-50. Even at 50-50, you have some. Uh, you don't have complete percolation. You still have some. Uh, uh, droplets in the matter of fact, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, but but uh, yeah, you don't have a bicontinuous structure. Only only the majority phase percolates basically. So I think uh, yeah, people like Ugi and all have worried a lot about how the uh, bicontinuous. That's the term people only use. This is not bicontinuous. This one is called bicontinuous. Huh? And you you do not call it uh, self similar. I'm saying no, it is self-similar. You're saying statistically similar. Yeah, it's not, similar. Yeah, it's not identical. I mean, as you can compare this with this. Uh, I mean, it's not identical. No, yeah. that's okay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. The properties of self-similarity are very different. Are the same. I see. I thought you had to be a perfect replica as you came no. down. No. Okay. okay. So then it's self-similar. In time, it's self-similar. And uh, length scale is just a sort of... Uh, uh, anyway, you can pretty much see that from the pictures. The length scale is just a sort of a, uh, what's it called, a scale factor for the distance uh, area. Okay. One point I should have made, I sort of made this blanket statement that there is no complete understanding of the structure factor of the correlation function, unlike the conserved case. Of course, you know some limits of it. For example, there are still sharp interfaces in the system. So you know that it will also have a Porod law like in the non-conserved case. But you don't know the complete function from k equal to 0 to k equal to infinity, unlike in the uh, non-conserved case. Okay, so that's the off-critical quench it's called. And if you go asymmetric enough, you finally start to hit this nucleation regime, and if you don't quench deep enough. And the result, the famous result of Lipschitz and Sears of 
applies when you have a vanishing fraction of one mixture is separating in uh, hundred percent of the other in the limit basically. Okay, but uh, that's a paper I still not understood fully. Okay, I've already made all these statements. I, I'm not going to talk about phase separation and surfaces. Let me sort of just conclude my lectures. I mean, we've been doing a whole lot of applications of this problem now, uh, all, all with, with more complicated dynamical processes. Uh, what I'm trying to focus on on this lecture is, uh, is the following. I've given you two examples of pattern formation in the kinetics of phase transitions. The dynamics of ordering of a ferromagnet, which we worked out in great detail and which we have a very good theoretical understanding of. And the dynamics of phase separation, which you can write down the model, you can simulate it, you can sort of compare the experiments and so on and so forth, but you don't have a good analytical handle on it yet. So this remains an outstanding problem in the area. As I said earlier, this is just the bread and butter of the subject. Now you can put in jam. What is the jam? You put surfactants into the system. Oil water phase separating with surfactants. Okay. That's a whole bunch of uh, problems. You can put disorder into the system. You can have a random fieldizing model, random modelizing model. That's a whole bunch of, uh, again, uh, sort of uh, problems we've opened up. Okay. So the, the field has just gone in very, very diverse areas. And I've just given you the starting point of uh, uh, understanding the sort of basic language of the main road for the integration of this transition. Okay. I should say, once you turn on disorder and things like that, then again, even our analytical understanding of the uh, of the uh, non-conserved case goes away. Okay. So for example, if you look at ordering in a random fieldizing model or a random modelizing model, what happens is that there the growth law goes from power law in the pure case to logarithmic. Why is it logarithmic? Because if the moving interfaces get trapped by local Disorder minima. Okay. And then the hopping over the disorder minima is thermally activated. In the famous paper of Hughes and Henley, where they estimated the barriers and the barrier scale as a power law with the domain size. Uh, uh, this was somewhere in the 80s. And people have used that to argue that there should be a logarithmic growth law. The crossover from power law growth to logarithmic growth law if you turn on effects, if you turn on disorder in the system. So anyway, as I said, there's many directions to go in, and people have explored some of these directions. Uh, our analytical understanding of coarsely kinetics relies on what defects are doing, okay? And the defects depend on the order of the order parameter, the number of components of the order parameter. You can have interfaces in ferromagnets, you can have vortices in liquid crystals, you can have monopoles in the, the early universe and so on and so forth okay i don't think that, so so that's for n equal to one n equal to two and n equal to three so these are somewhat like elementary particles and that's also the terminology with part, particle physicists use okay the elementary particles are uh, kink solutions of quantum field theory so it's very analogous to that except of course here the elementary particles are getting destroyed but but we encapsulate the kinetics in terms of the motion of these particles, their collision, and so on and so forth, and get a handle on pattern formation, at least in the non-conserved case. Okay, I didn't discuss the last one because uh, it's getting sort of uh, beyond the ambit of this course. Uh, uh, let me just end out here. Uh, one thing I want to guys to do as the last homework problem is you pick up that Kahn-Hilliard equation and do the linear stability analysis around a random initial condition. And in the, in the phase separation problem, the or, initial order parameter is zero plus fluctuations. That's the homogeneous problem. I want you to do linear stability analysis of that and tell me whether you come up with the uh, spinodal boundary and what is the spinodal boundary. Remember the spinodal boundary according to engineers is the region we distinguish between spontaneous phase separation and nucleated phase separation. And you can actually get that out of the linear stability analysis of your car linear equation. Okay. So please uh, do that as a common problem. And I'll end here and take any last questions if there are any.
the model mix as it's called uh, for MIPS is modeled by that active model B. It's just an auto parameter based model. Right. Like so, change or law will probably as long as you have coexisting interfaces, Oroch law is very robust. Well, but interface may not be very sharp. Yeah, but even if it's not very sharp, ultimately if the length scale goes to infinity, then this becomes irrelevant. So the direction depends on xi over L. No, possibly xi also may be infinite. I mean, xi may grow, and an interesting situation is when you have surfactants in oil water mixture. I, I, uh, surfactants continue to aggregate at the interface because that's energetically favorable. And the interface becomes thicker and thicker with time. So the divergence of the interface uh, width is the same as the divergence of the domain scale. Uh, scale and in that case, you don't get uh, 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 four odds wrong. Yeah. But uh, as long as y over L goes to zero, then you recover. So I mean, you think if you have short range interaction, probably you always get this sharp into. Uh, uh, no, I won't say so. If you're surfactants, you could have short, short range interaction in a system with surfactants. No, I on the model point of view. Even in the vacancy model I was talking about earlier, if you look at an A B vacancy model, the vacancies finally like to end up at the interfaces because that buffers the surface tension. Okay. And once the surface tension is buffered, then the drive yeah. to phase separate goes away. So then you're stuck at some large distance, right? I mean, some scale system, right? Yeah, sorry. No, that question I already had answered. Like, you know, so you have to keep that language. Yeah. And so then all these things should be kind of hope, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And also for the critical point. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and you approach the critical point and drive the same separate. Right? Well, the distinction between the two phases goes away at your point. Yeah, that's, yeah. But close to critical point below the. <coughs> right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then thank you. Thank you for being a good class. Okay. <laughs> so you can go for a cup of tea. Yeah, I think that would be the best. Yeah. Well. yeah. <laughs> so, in a concept case, for this is possible.